Good evening and welcome to Thank You Five. This is a weekly show hosted by Straw Dog Theatre Company, where we bring together theatre artists from around the globe into a conversation about live theatre in a digital world, always with the spirit of gratitude and innovation. Uh, my name is Michael Reyes. I am an ensemble member with Straw Dog Theatre Company, class of 2018. I'm also um, a, a member of the board of directors. I'm currently the president. Um, and I am a member of the great Chicago theater community and have been since a long time. So i um, very happy to be here tonight. Um, if you are watching this on YouTube, you can head over to strawdog.org slash thank you five to join the chat, ask questions, and more importantly, vote on questions. Uh, so we know which, uh, one, which one of those questions you want us to ask our panelists. And speaking of our panelists, I would love to now introduce you or have uh, have them introduce themselves to you, starting with Megan. Hi, I'm Megan Riley. I am a lighting and projections designer based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I teach at UW Madison. Fantastic, Devante. Hi, I'm Devante Johnson. I'm a scenic sound and projection designer uh, based out of Chicago. Awesome, Barbara. Hello, I'm Barbara Berlovitz, and I'm a theater practitioner, actor, director, teacher, and I'm in Minneapolis, and I've been doing it a long time. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Richard. Hi, I'm Richard Gustin. I'm a Milwaukee-based uh, playwright, uh, producer, director. Fantastic. So we are bringing you the Midwest flavor for tonight's Thank You Five. Around the globe means Midwest tonight. <laughs> um, okay, great. So now that we have uh, all met, I would like to start us off as we do um, yeah, with each one of these with our very first question, and that is, what is theater? And I will invite uh, my panelists to um, raise their hands, just speak, um, and uh, to start our conversation off. Who would like to go first? I can go first. I have a very uh, broad definition, I guess. Yeah. Um, uh, I feel like I answer this like all the time. Um, for me, theater is any event that has a performer and uh, some sort of text and um, a director or no director audience. I'm sorry, audience. Um, yeah, I don't even remember my own definition anymore. <laughs> And so the the actual like definitions of those things can be as broad or as narrow as you need them to be. But those are the core components. Those are the those are the core pieces. Like yes, if you but have I those can things point, you have theater, but I can point to you you to like examples of like where you are the both the writer and the director and the actor and the audience, for example. Okay. Awesome. Who's got another definition to start us off with? Yeah, go ahead, Barbara. Telling stories, uh, sharing stories is what I think theater is best at and what theater does most of the time. And it can be any kind of story and it can be told by anyone. But I think that's why we do theater and I think that's why we go to the theater. Um, to hear yeah. it, to, to, as, uh, when you say when we, how we, why we go to theater, as theater goers, we go to experience story? Yes. Yes, and that's, I mean, that, like Megan said, it's a very general definition because a story can be a lot of things, a lot of different things. Okay, We're gonna, we'll, we'll come back to, to those points. Um, okay. <laughs> who, who, who's, who's next here? I, I, I have a thought concerning yeah. it in the sense that I feel like I used to know what theater was. Um, <laughs> then I, I got a chance to go see, for the first time, the movie The Room. I don't know if people on this panel have gotten a chance to see that movie in person like if you actually go to see one of the kind of midnight shows it's very similar to like a rocky horror picture show sort of experience in the sense that um you know now it's it's a kind of a a, a calling that i have Any, anytime i see it i have to or i see like a poster it's like we're doing a midnight showing in the room i was like i have to go because in some ways that is also theater in the sense that you have an audience that is capable to perform something that is a kind of ritualistic sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, viewing session. 
And everyone is in some ways engaged in a theatrical performance, but also a viewer. You're also there to watch other people do that. And uh, if, I, if I'm going to say this, there's anything it, now that I find the most engaging is most, most of the time is that because you then also have a giant group of people where they're all kind of calling responding to that sort of uh, experience, which is, is, is very powerful. Um, and I think that, you know, other, other mediums also sort of contribute that to that as well. Like whether it's, uh, you know, a, you know, a, a soccer game or, you know, uh, uh, what is it? A monster truck rally. Like, like, I feel like that the, the definition is in some ways loose in that sense, because there is a certain level of performance that the audience participates in that isn't necessarily traditionally something that's written or involves a performer. So I, I feel like I used to know, and now I'm I'm not 100 percent sure what 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 is defined in that. Yeah, the participation aspect of it, you know, it's interesting because you know I don't know maybe when I was coming up, it was like you know you sit in your seat quietly and and listen to what they're saying and. You know, then however long ago it was um, in recent history, um, you know, immersive theater comes along and, you know, uh, you're sort of participating, but you're not really participating. But, you know, what you're talking about, Devante, I feel like is a little more participating. Like you're not, you know, we would never, I think, ask our audience members to actually engage in a physical way. But like there's, you know, there's a lot of uh, um, active participation there, it sounds like. For sure. I think... Uh theater is a shared experience um yeah. it's it's a something is being communicated um perhaps it's two people perhaps it's a um an influencer in new york who gathers thousands and thousands of people uh two days ago i think it was two days ago i mean that was theatrical um, that was a huge piece of theater in New York City. What was it? Uh, <laughs> the the influencer that uh, I I I forget the the, the person's name, but um, that with the the giveaway that perhaps yeah. maybe didn't happen. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I mean, uh, but I mean, wasn't that theater? I mean, isn't the nightly news theater? Isn't uh, Trump and the various GOP candidates and the Democratic candidates stumping, that's theatrical. Um, I mean, that's- You can that's, call political theater in that sense, right? Oh yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, if there, <laughs> if there are some people that have a sense of what theater is, it's, it's people who stump for public office. I mean, those are people who are in touch with the power of theater and uh, interfacing with other human beings with a message in a ritualistic way to get a desired response. It's more like a cult, I think, when it comes to politics. But I also think immersive theater is a cult, so. Well. When I think of Trump, I think of I think totally of like cult and indoctrination. It's a poor example. I mean, all I'm saying is currently, currently what we have, you know, on the horizon is a, is a, uh, a fixation on a particular individual, which all of us process through uh, the, you know, our lives through or, or not or whatever. But I mean, politics in its purest sense, of course, is, I mean, isn't it for the, for the public good? And there are some political people that are actually trying to do good. And so that's a whole different dynamic, but it's still a theatrical experience is all I'm saying, where something's being communicated to have a desired effect to bring about, I mean, Albi was always about social change, yeah? I mean, expanding the art form and leading to social change. And I think, I think theater does that, not in a social work way, but theater leads to social change, to awareness and social change, uh, you know, incrementally or hugely or yeah so um uh have um this may be a bit of a tangent but or, or, or stretch um but did you all read that article the the washington post article oh my uh, God. opinion piece <laughs> no 
We have opinions on this. Kyle, I thought this wasn't going to be brought up. <laughs> well, I feel like, you know, it just happened. Uh, you know, I feel like maybe we we should, you know, um, uh, it sounds like we all have strong opinions about it, but like, you know, the, you know, the, um, we'll, we'll leave that aside. I'm just, I guess the reason I brought it up for now is that, you know, we're, we're in a, we're in a space now where we're, we are sort of collectively trying to like, you know, define theater. And I, and I think maybe I got a little bit of a hint in that. And maybe, you know, there's sort of around the edges of what we've been talking about here too, is I wrote down in my little notes here, like, what is the point of theater? You know, um, is it to entertain? And, and specifically, I guess I would say, you know, what are our thoughts on, you know, why theater now? Like, I, I, I uh, always think of theater as um, in person. Um, the very first one of these panels that I participated in, someone um, shared their experience, and um, I invite you to go listen to the um, recaps of it. Um, but they uh, changed my perspective on uh, how. Devante, I had a, I was I was very sure what it was, and now I'm like, hmm, maybe not so sure. So I, you know, to me, it sounds like uh, we're we're coming in together on those, some things that shared. Um, there's a, there's a ritual um, to that. I would add in person, um, but I don't know what do you, what what's the like uh, is wh why do we do theater? Yeah, Megan. Oh, why do we do theater? Yeah, what is the point? Yeah, what? Yeah, I. Mean, what, I I think that there, why we do it is because we have to. I don't think that we hope that we as theater artists don't have another secret calling that we could have done that would have made more money. But um, I think that why we, like what theater does and what it is is more, it's different for every person. I think there's a lot of theater that can affect social change. And I, I think that, but I think that saying all theater can is a bit, I just really dislike saying all or none or things like that, or it never does or whatever. Um, because I'm also, especially within immersive theater has been my research area for years. And within that, I have gone from very pro immersive theater to almost anti immersive theater, um, because I've seen a lot of things within it that I don't think are positive, um, for this, the, the idea of togetherness. We can be in the same room at a production of Sleep No More, and we can eat, we can treat each other like we are not there because a lot of that is so um, capitalist and in pursuit of your own personal experience of the show. Um, whereas when we're watching something on stage, there's no like, I'm not getting a better experience than you are necessarily, except for ticket prices and all that stuff. Um, so there's no need to grasp at like my experience versus the person's experience next to me. We're not competing for things. Um, which I see in almost every show, immersive theater show I've been in, I've seen examples of that by been and I mean gone to <laughs> coming coming out of COVID where I went almost nowhere and did not see any theater and did not participate in theater and in this last so oh, six months I've really started to see things again and be in a room with people and I I think that's another big reason why we do theater and why we go to the theater because you're you're in a room with people and what there have been studies done that as you're watching something that everyone starts to breathe alike or everyone's heartbeat starts to beat the same in the room. And I think that connection to our fellow human beings is the main reason we do theater. Whether we're in a theater group of people, a group of three, two, you know, or 10 or 20, whatever it is, creating something. And that feeling of we're all in this together, we're all creating something together, we all have a similar goal. And that extraordinary feeling, which most of the time, or a lot of the time in our daily lives, we don't have that. Most people don't have that. Mm -hmm. And then that coupled with, as an audience person, you're walking into a room with a bunch of people who've all come to see the same thing. They might not receive it exactly the same way, uh, they might be there for different reasons. Somebody might be on a date and trying to impress somebody <laughs> uh, to someone was dragged there because they, you know, they really didn't want to be there. doesn't matter. They're all in the room together. And at some point, they're experiencing the same thing. They'll respond possibly differently, but, they'll, but they're all in the room together. And I, I just think that's why we do theater. It, it gives us a chance to experience humanity 
I do think, and this might be moving us way off into another realm, but I do think that theater right now, and I imagine you all feel this too, is, is it's in a huge uh, transformation. And what it's transforming to, I do not know, <laughs> obviously, because it's transforming. But I think that um, we're searching for what the new the new types of theater, the new voices that are coming out, the new places that are being performed in. I know in Minneapolis, sorry, should I shut up? <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. In, in Minneapolis, I know that uh, there's a lot of smaller spaces that are being rehabbed or people are going into more spaces that aren't theaters and creating theater work. You know, it's like we're moving away from, you know, the the all the accoutrement of a theater to what do we need to make theater, you know, and that, I think that's a good thing, you know, yeah. I don't know, that, that sounds like my very first black box Chicago theater show <laughs> where we're scraping things together. I mean, I I definitely um, uh, am a fan of smaller spaces, but actual spaces. I don't, I'm, oh, can't believe I'm about to put this on record, but um, I don't really like the outdoor experience. You know, I like lighting designers. I like set designers. I like, you know, being able to see things. I like, um, you know, all the time that um, we spent with our vocal teachers and voice coaches and whatnot, being able to do those fun things or, you know, activate on, on those things. Not that you can't do it in uh, in an outdoor setting. Maybe I just can't do it in an outdoor setting, but I like I like the, the trappings, I guess, of, of all the theater and because it makes for um, an experience uh, for, for me. And, and honestly, that's, you know, I like being embedded in all of that experience. I don't know, Richard, Devante, um, so uh, don't know if you have any thoughts on um, the question I posed earlier, and like, what's the point of theater? I mean, I feel like there's always definitely a, a, an importance and necessity of theater. I think, you know, from the original question posed, you know, what is theater, right? Like the answer is just so wide. I think in terms of what American theater is specifically, I think the biggest question is what is the commodification of theater in relationship to, how, is it an entertainment sort of product? Or is it something that is of social merit? And I think that there is a dollar value associated with that answer. And I think that in some ways, we're at a precipice of under, like figuring out which way that's going to turn in terms of what becomes a viable solution in the future. And how does that like look? Um, in the sense that I do see a lot, like in terms of the larger theaters, we're seeing that sort of like interesting shift of not being able to support themselves. And yet I also see a lot of smaller theaters actually still producing work. So it's like, then what does that mean? Because it's not as if we don't want to say that people shouldn't be paid, but it's like, what is that? What are we doing? I think then that really is kind of the question because I it, it makes me actually think about, you know, what what are what are those core essence of storytelling? You know, I remember there's a there's a movie that recently came out uh, called The Northman, uh, which is uh, about Vikings. Yeah. Um, and uh, what's really fun is that in the beginning, or I guess you could say halfway through, I don't know, but there's a a point in which where you know, right before the, I guess the transition of age of the main character, there's this like ritual that he has to go through because his father's the king, and he's led that starts off in the hall it's like this storytelling that then has led to to like him transforming into something but it's all just a piece of theater that is partially participated by the everyone in the hall and then partially participated by the the viking king and his son and in that sense the the lead performer is the shaman of the tribe mm -hmm. and what is that because clearly that person is important that storytelling is important but i don't think anyone gave that person more value other than the, you know, the town fool, but he was actually a very important component to, you know, producing and uh, giving history to the culture, to um, having a, a set of context to what they're doing. And I think that in that sense, yeah, theater is definitely important. I think that we have to come to terms in this modern age of like, what is the commodification of it in relationship to its importance? Because I think that that is the, the interesting thread that's being sown right now. Um, I couldn't agree with you more, Megan. Um, earlier, when you were talking about the three pieces of theater, um, I was recently in a conversation um, 
around producing something. And I mentioned that to, you know, uh, the person that will end up being the producing partner. I said, there are three components to theater. She said, actually, there's four. And the fourth one is money. <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, it's about the, and then I'm like, oh yeah, you're right, Devante, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> some I think that that is true for some types of theater, but we can I I am trying to create a piece of virtual reality theater right now, and yeah, I guess there's money involved because I'm getting research money to do it. I suppose yeah, but um, you know y'all could come and if I had it working right now, y'all could come see it <laughs> for no money. Um, and I would say that like a lot of um, you know, there's a lot of uh not immersive theater but immersive experiences that can go on in the world around us like happenings or um, I'm not sure what the thing with the YouTube star was but um, that is all free in a way like we don't pay to see that but it also like what you both were saying was talking about like getting back to the Washington Post article which um, my reaction to that was like but I want to be paid you know, yeah. and I want to do, I, you're talking about wanting, enjoying the trappings of theater. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to do theater in the backyard anymore. Um, I do want to do theater with the lights and the sets and all of the stuff. And so I don't know how to respond to the conversation that pushes us in this direction of theater should be, you know, something that isn't commodified or something that isn't involving money because to pay us, we need money. I think what it's a real problem for us is that as a country, we don't value the arts. So, you know, the government doesn't, politicians don't, um, relative to the rest of the world, let's say. And I, I guess I shouldn't say that because I don't know the rest of the world, but many countries in the rest of the world value art a lot more than we do. and. So I think it's easier to feel like you have some worth without having to chase um, money all the time because the money does happen, even though it's not, you know, it's a livable wage as opposed to no wage, <laughs> which is what we have a lot of in this country. You know, most actors aren't making anything. I don't know if everybody's following what's happening with the, the strike out in Hollywood, but um, you know, a lot of people have been posting, this is what I make. These are the shows I've worked on and this is what I make. And it's, you know, it's ridiculously small. I mean, yeah, it's ridiculously small relative to what, you know, certain, certain people in the industry are making. So yeah, we just don't value it. So that's a big hurdle for us. And I don't know how you get over it. And the bigger institutions, you know, for the most part are eating up a lot of the funds. When you look at how the, the pie is split and, you know, and how much goes to the bigger institutions. And then the argument is, well, they're bigger, you know, and they have more expenses, but there's ways to spend money. <laughs> and I don't know if we've always done it well. You know, I, I'm curious. Oh, no, sorry. No, go ahead, Devante. Richard, you had something to say um, uh, before I felt like if you wanted to... Well, I mean, it's, it, it's apples and oranges, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to talk about the Guthrie or Louisville or Milwaukee Rep or ACT or, uh, you know, uh, New York's theaters, I mean, it's apples and oranges. I mean, yeah, Megan's doing a piece of theater or Devante or Barbara or Michael or whomever is doing a piece of theater with a small amount of money and they're doing important work and and yet uh you know these theaters in New York are tightening their belts their their you know their 30 million dollar belts I mean they're they're really trying to tighten it and trying to, uh, you know, make it work with what they've been doing in, in the past. And um, I mean, in my mind, <laughs> to get back to the original, why do we do theater? Well, to spread understanding and compassion for the human condition. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why we do theater. And because we're lonely. I mean, why we, 
why the arts is because we're very lonely, isolated uh, as individuals. We're social animals. We need to come together in groups. Um, we need friendship. We need love from others. We need to share this fear that we have in our lives, right? Our joys, our fears, our <laughs> ecstasy, our our depths of despair. And theater does that in a, I mean, so does dance. I mean, so does music. But when you combine them all, you have the theatrical experience, of course, where you have all the art forms, yeah, uh, in the theatrical experience. And it's a, um, I mean, sometimes, you know, as well as I do, Sometimes a person's life is actually changed by an experience they have at the theater. Their, their life, is, life is actually changed. Well, you know, everyone's striving to do that, right? <laughs> to make a difference. So, I mean, why are we, you know, why theater? Why are we theater artists? Trying to make a difference, right? Yeah, yeah. Devante, do you want to step in here then? Or? Yeah, um, only that I feel like, um, once again, we're in an interesting time because I feel like, uh, you know, we're, we're in some ways like what if as as far along we try to define theater, you know, we look at these other art forms that are actually doing pretty well, which is like to say is going to Lollapalooza theater. Like, I mean, there are definitely theatrical components to it. I don't know. Uh, is going to go see a Taylor Swift concert theatrical. I don't know. I mean, I haven't seen one, but I know she seems to put on a, a pretty good show, I guess. But I think the reality is, is that in those components, if we want to really talk about money, they're making tons of money. Yeah. So then it's like, what does that mean? Because then in a lot of ways, we would more classify that as entertainment. But at the same time, I know people have been changed by going to go see those things and they've had connections to go see those things and they've had life altering experiences. So it's like, is there something to that that we are missing? Is there something to that that uh, is valid? Or is it an invalid form in which we need to go in the opposite direction? Because clearly that direction is making a lot of money. That's a really interesting point. You know, 900 years ago when I was a freshman in college, um, I had a professor who was absolutely certain, absolutely certain that theater was dead and that it was going to be replaced by video games. And like, the, it was only a matter of time, wrote a whole paper on it, had discussions about it. And then of course, you know, um, theaters, uh, or excuse me, video games are, you know, I was, let's go ahead admit that I was playing one <laughs> before the, before our conversation tonight. And it's a story, you go through a whole story. It's an experience. <laughs> the whole, video games are theater. The whole way through. So, I mean, um, Certainly theater in 1923 is very different than, let's just even say theater in 2003, right? Things have changed, things are very different. The way we approach it, the way we, you know, what, what we actually do, how we actually execute it, what we think is quality, what we think is, you know, I don't know, right, um, let's say is very different, you know, was very different hundred years ago than it is now. So. Um, I mean, I, I think it was you, Richard, that, that said it maybe, um, or maybe I'm thinking of a different panel, but like theater's never going to die. It's always going to be around. We're always, we're always going to do it. There's always going to be a need to be in person. I personally think there's always going to be a need to be in intimate settings in person. Um, but um, I don't know what, uh, what has to change. Um, and I, you know, we can include social components, uh, I suppose, if we want, but it's been part of the conversation for, you know, very hot uh, part of the conversation for a while. But um, uh, what, what uh, you know, if we were to save theater, if we were to like, you know, figure out, let's, let's solve the commoditization question. Let's solve, let's solve theater right now. <laughs> and thank you, five. I don't know, what, what are your thoughts on, 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 on that? You know, I started a theater company in uh, 78, 1978. And for well, close to 10 years, we didn't make really much of a salary. And we, the way we survived was living together, not because we were a commune, <laughs> but because that was cheaper. And uh, we ate a lot of our meals together. 
um, we pooled all of our resources together. And people ask me now, you know, 50 years later, well, how did you guys do that? <laughs> and it's a completely different world. And I think now, so for instance, what I see now in people who are coming out of the colleges and stuff and people who have a lot of talent and drive and energy and wanting to do something, they also have a definite side job. And maybe not just maybe not waiting tables. And that's not to disparage waiting tables, but to really have uh, a job that is maybe more secure and offers health care and you know things that you need to survive essentially. And then theater is somehow fit into that picture. And I know we've always done that somewhat, but I think right now, I don't know how you do how you how you do anything else but that if you're going to be creating work i think that if we want to fix theater we have to fix that like how are we going to make a living at this you know a lot of us are really highly trained and want to do this as the make as as our living and instead a lot of us are are working two jobs i worked i worked a day job for 11 years in texas and now i work as a professor and most of my income comes from being a professor um I think that there's supposed to be some sort of goal out there where that is not necessary. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think it was really important for us and we made, you know, we made an agreement that we weren't going to have a side job the whole time we had the company. We didn't have side jobs. So that meant that, you know, we worked long hours, but we were just doing the work and that affects what the work's going to be, obviously. If you have to have another job that's not theater, that's doing something else, that's going to affect you and it's going to affect you. It might affect you positively, negatively. I don't know. It'll affect you some one way or another. But if you're able, actually able to do the, you know, the work that you want to be doing all the time, you know, that's, that's a really great luxury. And um, I don't know how you do that today. Do we as... as uh, um... I don't know, as a society, do we do that? I mean, we're, it, it seems like we, our attention is split into so many different, so many different ways. Um, now, especially. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you know, maybe for um, some folks that have been at it for a long, you know, for a while, that um, I, I, I hear you loud and clear, uh, Barbara, about specialization and, and you know, put, putting, you know, deep, deep roots into um, the work. Um, on the necessity side, you know, I, I know, most companies, uh, nobody does 10 out of 12 anymore, I don't think, do they? Do we do, we do 10 out of 12s? Yeah, okay. Um, but Every like once in Chicago, a while. Every yeah. once in a while. Okay. Yeah. In Chicago, it it's- depends uh, on the con It depends on the contract. Yeah, okay, okay. Well, if you're in a cat, if you're in a cat tier three, three tier four, tier five, yeah, mm -hmm. you're, you're probably doing a 10 out of 12. Sure, sure. Like doing it, eight out of 10. Yeah, in, 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 the, in the kind of theater world that I operate in, where you have to have another job, you know, 10 out of 12, those, that's just not, it's not human anymore. You know, you gotta have time to do your laundry and you have to, and, and fit in your day job. So, but it feels like we're, we're working those kinds of things in. Um, Megan, you were. Um, well, I, I am like the only person on the planet who never saw a problem with 10 out of 12s. Um, like, <laughs> sorry, Barbara. <laughs> um, but a lot of that is because when you do the math for designers, I don't believe that it works out to do um, to to do away with them. I mean, you we I remember when the pandemic hit and I was still working and did a big musical somewhere. Um, they tried to do away with ten out of twelves right then, then and there, and the production suffered because of it. Like there just was no time for the designers to do the work that they do on the breaks. Um, and I know that we're not supposed to be doing that. But we all want nobody, no designer that I know wants to just work and get a paycheck and then leave, like leave the show unfinished or leave leave notes untackled. We all, a lot of us, most of us do that. I mean, I I, I don't want to say we all anymore, but um, yeah, I just feel like if you do the math for designers, for lighting designer, if I if I am working shows where the 10 out of 12 is done away, then there have to be an extended text. And if there are extended texts that I have that I can't take on as many shows to make up an actual living. 
so for a theater to do out away with those with the 10 out of 12s then you have to raise a, a stipend um i don't know how else to fix that situation for for the designers i don't know about anybody else well i was trying to fix it by winning the you know mega but that didn't work um Devante, <laughs> were you about to say something on this too no, I was I was just going to agree with Megan. I mean, it's not as if I was like, I love 10 out of 12s. It's just that I, I did the math in terms of that exact same equation, which I think when it was first starting to be thrown around, that was my first kind of like devil devil's advocate sort of critique, which was like, all right, so are we adding more days or is it the same amount of days? Because if it's the same, then you're basically saying we're just cutting tech by six hours. Oh, okay, cool. So we have to do the same work with six less hours, unless we're adding a day, but then you want me there an extra day, you know, like that, like you said, it's like that, that is the math. And um, I think that they were like, oh yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> like that, that, that kind of went by the ways five. And, you know, I enjoy like a two hour dinner break. You know, I can, I can really get some uh, good, good, like halfway to, cross town to, 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 to get a meal. I actually have uh, gone, uh, mini golfing once I went bowling <laughs> like seriously like the the I was a powerhouse in the 10 out of 12s which you give me two hours I will go to the top of mountain come back be like I'm ready guys be like where'd you guys go <laughs> oh yeah we went like uh hiking we went to the top of you know whatever and we came back with it I mean seriously I went I went to go uh putt putting and I went to a hibachi that was like, and we like maxed it out. We got back right like 15 minutes before we started uh, tech again. And That's people amazing. were shocked. They were like, I don't know how you did that. I was like, there's a wheel, there's a way. So. That's amazing. That's amazing. Like, no, look at, I'm just going to say that my first 10 out of 12 was Straw Dog. Um, we like, there's pictures of us. We did it at fact where the factory theater is right now. There are pictures of us all sort of in a pile asleep <laughs> the couches <laughs> after our dinner. But while, while, while the designers did their thing in the in the space. <laughs> that's we another thing is that like the 10 out of 12, that's where I write my light cues. That's where that work yeah. happens. And if yeah. I can't I mean, have the bodies on stage I mean, to do well, it. I mean, 10 out of 12s are necessary. I mean, people were fighting to not have a to not have 16 out of 24. I mean, a hundred and some odd years ago. I mean, where you could be worked, you could be worked 14 hours a day. And if if you're not staying, you're gone. There's someone else that's going to take your job. So I mean, yeah, I mean, Actors Equity did a lot to to stand up for performers, right? SAG, et cetera, AFTRA, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, those are, those are all good things. But ten out of twelve, I mean, is 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 uh, easy peasy compared to what people were doing a hundred years ago. Uh, well, then, you know, there is an argument that, like, <laughs> on balance, you know, you're not, you know, 10 out of 12 for a weekend is, you know, spread that out over every time. I mean, time come on. I mean, come on. <laughs> they're, they're, they're perfectly fine, well, and good, and they're necessary, as Megan's saying, for, for, for tech. You want to get the show right? You need 10 out of 12s. I mean, golly gee. Um, well, I, think, I mean, the tech... The tech, I mean, the tech has to be right, not just right, it has to be perfect. Yeah. Tech, right? Yeah. I mean, tech that's perfect is very different from tech that's sloppy. You want sloppy tech? You want, no. I mean, no one wants to be in a show with sloppy tech. 10 out of 12, come on. I mean, I guess because I've been in the theater for 50 years and I mean, it just, it's just what we always have done. And so maybe that's what I'm speaking from. I mean, I'm not speaking from, yeah, I'm speaking from a union point of view of having done it that way forever. And it's a good thing to get the tech right. Otherwise you have Spider-Man. Sorry, I didn't mean to bring that up. Well, yeah, <laughs> it, well, yeah. I work with somebody who worked on that show. Oh my goodness. Yeah say more about that but um i'm sorry if i was interrupt i sorry i interrupted i did interrupt um i don't always know when i can jump in with something um but i just wanted to say, say complete agreement with you that like if we don't get the tech right because the rehearsal is shorter then we're just going to have to do it again 
And then we're taking time away from the actors doing their work. Um, so it's better in my, in my opinion, if we can get it right the first time during that long rehearsal at 10 out of 12, and then come back and actually run the show a million times. <laughs> So we won't solve it here. And I'm not, I'm, I was mostly, mostly joking when I said we we're going to solve it here. But like, so it, is there a universe where we shake things up a bit and we do something very different that honors uh, the, yeah, let's, let's, I'm going to lump all of tech into one group of people. Um, uh, one group is that, that, that honors what you need and honors what, um, you know, we've sort of been, lately reacting to um I, again we don't have to answer that today i i just i just throw it out there as, to, as a way of saying i don't know maybe this is uh maybe this is uh a frontier to there's, ruminate on there's so many frontiers oh sorry yeah go ahead go ahead i was just gonna say there's just so many frontiers of how tech is uh op like operates throughout like the different disciplines that I feel like, I mean, if theater really wanted to make any sort of headway and like why there would be less time, it would also have to be a question of like how we approach theater period. Because I mean, I just worked on a dance show. There was barely any tech time. I mean, it was still fine, but that was just how it runs. I mean, they just, you just can't work dancers like that because they just are, you know, that you get them to run it once, you get them to kind of step through it again, and then it's opening. So then you have like walkers who kind of help, you know, do it, but they're not really the dancers. So then you just got the music to, with the timing and opera is similar where you just have a piano tech and they just kind of stand one place or the other. They don't sing the whole way out because I mean, why would they, they're going to like damage the thing that people came to go see. So, but, and then concerts is even more brutal. Like you don't even get them. Like <laughs> you, you just like, Maybe there's somebody with piano, they might play a little bit, but then they're like, you know what's going on, right? We're done, right? And then, then it's the concert. So um, we the theater requires just a lot of time. And that's just how we've kind of designed it in that sense. But if isn't, it, less isn't, time, it's different. Isn't part of the problem, Devante, isn't part of the problem that dry tech is usually not used, not, not utilized very well in most theaters? I mean, dry tech is about getting ready for the actors yeah but but so often dry tech is uh wasted and i mean if dry tech was uh done in an effective way i i just think everyone would be a lot happier doing wet tech it's true I, I i think that in some ways a lot of a lot of like impulses are based off of like emotional moments which may not have been fully explored until tech and I think that if that was like the thing that was blocked out in some way, then I think dry tech probably could be utilized more. I don't know if people operate in that realm. Well, but... that's well, that's why you have understudies, don't you? I mean, I, I, I mean, at least in my thinking, that's why you have understudies to actually uh, do things during dry tech and run some moments. Uh, yeah, okay, you know, you have, but why not use the understudies in that way or the, uh, you know, the the uh, understudy dancers or whomever Devante, i don't know that world as well but uh i mean i certainly use my understudies that way to get the dry tech right and 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 to work on moments with the understudy even though the principles aren't there that's okay um you know the understudies are uh worth their weight in gold as a former understudy i can just tell you richard um we appreciate every minute <laughs> that a director will spend with just us so thank you on behalf of all understudies everywhere for that um something we've been talking about something that you know we may have been thinking about in the world today is uh, we we keep saying tech and i want to like um uh uh expand that to technology is there something Purely a question for my own behalf. Is there some is there some way to technologically enable uh, the the work that you do that um, might make uh, a, your that would streamline your uh, I sound like a corporate uh, guy now right now, but like that that might um, tighten the timing that you uh, need to 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 do certain things. I'm I'm resisting using the the phrase AI, <laughs> but because it's not appropriate, it's not it's not even correct. But um, is there a way to do that? I don't know. 
Yeah, Megan. I'm not even thinking of an answer that involves AI. I was just thinking about um, yeah. that. Uh, I think we we figured a lot of things out during the pandemic about how to remotely do theater. And I'm not talking about Zoom theater. I'm talking about me sitting here and taking a show in Arkansas, um, which did happen. Um, but we also have like a lot of designers have um, visualization tools where we can supposedly put all our lights in or whatever it is, and then, you know, cue them within these programs. And I, I did that once and perhaps it was my like, first time doing it and this is why this happened but when I brought the cues onto the stage they didn't look anything like what they were supposed to mm. so I did that like 400 light cues for a show just to get it all in the system and load it all onto the board way ahead of time and then had to do it all anyways um so the day that like that works like perfection that's great um and I think a lot of lighting designers do have that figured out I've never been as enamored of the technology as I have been of the picture that's going on on stage. And so I haven't learned all that as well as I should possibly. I going back to uh, what we were saying before about live in person, just together yeah. in a room. Yeah. I don't know, Devante, you, you're a you're a tech person as well. Um, I would love to hear what you, your thoughts on this. Yeah. I mean, um, in some ways, if the, like if the rehearsals were recorded and we teched off of the rehearsals, that would be like, I think a, a way to move forward. The problem is, is that usually rehearsal halls don't necessarily have like the real scenic pieces in there. Yeah. Uh, I know that actually, uh, I, I just worked recently at uh, uh, Florida or, yeah, I'm so sorry, oh, I'm blanking, but it's the a solo rep, also oh, rep. Yeah. Uh, their new space, uh, their new kind of like production space allows for them to have like the actual set in rehearsal it's kind of crazy. It's like actually in a physically separate space. Then they tear it down and they put it into real space, which is wow. really great for them. But I mean, even more so if there was like a, a world where they just recorded that and then it was all in time, then we could just basically, we would just, could we could just sit with the stage manager and just like write the cues while that's happening, which could be a, a, an interesting way of doing it. But I think there would just be more mechanisms that would be necessary. But I think that that's an interesting path. I know there's a lot of hurdles with that too, but yeah, more than just you know the ASM uh, on their phone trying to do <laughs> right, <laughs> right. It would have to be like a real recording. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> multiple mm -hmm. multiple viewpoints, um, multiple mm -hmm. cameras, that kind of thing. Um, I you know that was one of the questions we had at a at a prior panel too, uh, which is like how does uh, how does technology you know what how does you know um how is uh how, how are we doing um theater you know effectively digitally um in the world in, in our in our in our our world today um any other general thoughts on on that i mean i personally i love the i love all of the traditional tech i love you know what everybody else looks like under the lights i love the costumes that i wear i love actually getting the the actual prop i want to sit on the thing that i'm going to be sitting on um, so that doesn't really, I mean, I, maybe other actors it does, but it doesn't really affect me. Um, but I don't know, what about the, the rest of the theater disciplines in the world? Your thoughts? I I remember, I was, <laughs> I was making, doing theater uh, before uh, light boards got computerized. So what that meant was, <laughs> yeah, I'm an old lady. Uh, so... <laughs> I know what that involved. That's why I'm laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so what that meant was, and please correct me if this is wrong, because I never did it myself. Well, I guess I did a couple of times, but it meant that we also had the light designer <laughs> run the board. So you had the designer bringing up the lights relative to what was going on on the stage. And maybe, you know, one night that that cue was a three count. Maybe one night it was a five count. Maybe, you know, one night it really took a lot longer than that because the person running the lights was in tune with what, what was going on. When it got computerized, I remember very distinctly that things felt more mechanical and we didn't, you didn't have that sensibility. And the great things about designers is they have a sensitivity and a sensibility and they need to be included in the creating of what is going on. And it's not just walking into the room and say, you know, here's put that light there and, you know, put a gel in it. It's just, 
it's yeah <laughs> i can get on a high horse a really high horse you know and, and i i appreciate everything everybody's saying about the 10 out of 12s but my experience is very different i have worked 10 out of 12s i have done that especially as an actor i've done that and it's i always thought it was kind of crazy but as a company, what we tried to do, we especially were successful at it for a long time, was everybody was in the room all the time. So that meant the designers were there with us. Now that also meant then the designers were part of the creation of the show. So it gave designers an opportunity to try things as we were creating the show. We had, um, you know, after years of doing shows, we had a stock of costumes. So the costume designer was able to go into stock and try things on, or actors could go pull things out and try things on and eventually work towards the real costume that they were going to wear. So things were getting created from the get-go. So you never had a 10 out of 12 because by the time you got to what you might call our tech week, which basically just meant we were running through the show a lot, <laughs> Um, things were kind of teched <laughs> because they had been, been getting teched all along. Now, I know that that's probably next to impossible for most people to experience. I do know that a lot of the designers who worked with us doing that loved it. It also meant that then they couldn't probably work on other shows if they were working with us on a show. And I know that's a way to... And you have to pay people enough money so they're able to stay with you during, you know, we would rehearse shows for, I don't know, eight weeks. <laughs> well, paying up in, a, in a such a way that it, you know, it makes sense too, right? Because like, uh, well, that's a, well, we, can, we can talk about payroll in another, yeah. <laughs> another thank you five. Okay. Um, yeah. Devante, I see you're nodding your head a lot. You have, you have other things to say about that? No, head? I mean, I, I agree wholeheartedly um, in the sense that I think what we have, allowed over time i mean this is just like a natural occurrence that like the next thing kind of evolves things to the next level in the sense that you know it's, it could technology is convenient and this is true for you know theater it's true for everything it allows for whatever you're doing to be compartmentalized and in a lot of ways that's really what has happened to designers that's why we work on like a bunch of shows at once because in the end uh you know production companies has found that, you know, you don't really need to be there the whole time. I mean, if I've made a projection design and everything is in a computer, like me pressing a button every time there's a show is very different than one of the first shows that I ever did, which was, I had like multiple cameras. I had a, a video board. I had like three DVD players. Like, I don't think anybody else could have done what I did simply because of the way I did it and the resources that I had, like, there's just no way. And I had to make sure that I played it the right way and then faded it up like there's this like it was impossible but that show was cool i mean i don't think it, like I, i'm really proud of that show um and i don't think that's an expectation for every show to be like that but nevertheless like that kind of work necessitates that kind of design you know and that type of like engagement and is that the type of theater that we want to produce which mm -hmm. is that level of engagement of our designers and if that's the case then you know maybe we rethink of how the structure of theater works in terms of that like is your designer also your managing director you know it's like like is there a way for the people who are involved in the production to be more intensely involved in the in the company itself and it makes it a little bit more worthwhile for them to actually engage in that kind of like more intensive more like valuable work as a designer versus just like putting some stuff together which is hard in of itself but doesn't answer the question of you know time which if they are involved more then there's less time necessary to actually tech the show uh but that's a once again going to the structural you know nature of like how we set up theater do we want to continue to do it like this because the answer, like I said before, which is like, oh, maybe we recorded and then we tech from that is further divergent from actually that kind of intensive theater. Yeah. But the actual answer could also be the very opposite, which is like, well, maybe they're just there the whole time. So. Well, I, you know, not that this is going to solve theater or solve the question that we're talking about, but I, I love that because I've always, I always felt a little bit of sadness, like that we see 
the designers and everybody at the first read and we're like, yay, we're a great big happy family. And then, and of course, you know, as actors, we got to get down to business. We got to like, you know, kind of work the thing. But then, you know, you never get to see designers uh, until tech. And, you know, but at that point, I'm like, you know, you, you, your lights, right? <laughs> you know, so uh, I love the idea of having, oh, that's not true. I mean, I'm, 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 um, you know, I'm, I'm being dramatic. I mean, of course, we see designers, you know, partway through the run and or, or rehearsals and that kind of sort of thing as well. But, um, um, I, yeah, uh, more together, more, which is, by the way, one of the things that we said at the beginning of this whole conversation, being together in the room. I mean, that's as, that's as much for us as it is for us plus an audience, I feel like, was what we're saying here. Um, um, we have about three minutes left. I know in our green room session, I, I promised you that we would do a little bit of a round robin. We're going to do that, but I'm going to add. Uh, I'm going to add one, so I'm going to do it now. Um, and I would like to know very briefly um, from each of you what do you love about doing theater? Just real brief. Raise your hand if you want. I'll give you a second to think about it, and then whoever wants to pipe in, do that. The the immediacy. Yeah. It's 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 not canned. It's never canned. Uh, it's immediate. It's visceral. It's alive. You can't, uh, yeah, you, you can't put it in a can. Okay. The people who were there are there for one time. It's once. It happens once. That's some people would say sacred. Some people would say magical. Yes. <laughs> I would say yes. <laughs> I don't know who's next. Megan. Um, this is a, I don't know, this is not a sacred answer. Um, I, I don't, yeah. Uh, I love the collaborations where everybody is on the same page and we put together something on stage that looks like we were there, um, not necessarily physically, but, but definitely mentally and emotionally in the same room, creating the same play. When that happens, I'm like on cloud nine. That doesn't always happen. Like, let's not, you know, fool ourselves about that. Um, I've just never been, I've never been a person who has some sacred idea about what theater is. I, I love doing it for, because I, I am good at it and I enjoy the relationships I make. That's, that's what I love. Connection. I love that. I love that. Um, uh, Barbara. It depends on what hat I'm wearing. <laughs> if I'm <laughs> acting, I love, I love the, the connection with the audience and with my fellow actors. I love, I love playing with an act, another actor on stage and the, the, the way we were able to play off of each other and, and listen to each other and, um, and the intimacy of all of that, and the same thing with the intimacy with the audience. And I just think that's brilliant. Um, as a as a teacher, I really love watching the students start to enjoy what they're doing and start to understand it and start to have ideas about it. And um, that's really rewarding also. I don't know about awesome. as a director, I don't know. <laughs> about to bring us all on this question. Yeah. Um, for me, I just love being surprised. I love it when people surprise me. I love it when I surprise myself. Um, but you know, you, you always, especially when you read a script, you always think you always know the whole thing and you break it all down. And then you, all of a sudden you see something that's on stage, whether it's a design element or actor and you say, wow, did I, I, did I, did I miss that part in the story? Like I actually, did I forget that? <laughs> oh, wow. That's cool. You know, and you, you, you really hear or see something that you really wasn't, you didn't expect it in that way. So love being surprised. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, and, and thank you for saying that because I surprised you with this round robin piece. Um, uh, we are going to do, we are going to do the, the one we talked about in, in green room. And that is, I want um, to hear from all of you, or we would love to hear from all of you. Um, uh, a book or a play um, that you might that you have um, been um, that you want to recommend to to the group. Um, we'll keep it real quick. We'll do, we'll do a fast round robin on that. And while you think of that, um, I am going to uh, say thank you um, to uh, everyone who's uh, participated today. We actually have five thank yous 
uh, that we like to go through. Thank you, thank you, thank you, all of these panelists that are here. Um, virtual round of applause if you are um, uh, watching us online. Um, I would want uh, also to thank Kyle Hammond, uh, who is the creator and producer of this show. Um, thank you also to OfficeHours.Global, uh, Edwin Ruiz and Mondo Machine for helping to make all of this possible. Uh, again, one of the most, you know, one of my favorite things to do for Strawdog. Um, and speaking of Strawdog, thank you to Strawdog, um, the, uh, the, the company. We are an ensemble. Um, so this show is made possible by that ensemble. And uh, so thank you, my Strawdog friends. Um, we are a, a theater company that runs on a free theater model. I don't know why I did air quotes. It's not, it's not suggested. It's definitely a free theater model. Um, our productions are available to anyone free of charge. Uh, so we can only do this with generous donations from our community. Um, and um, you can find out more about uh, donating or becoming a sustaining member to uh, continuously support our work on our website. Um, and our final thank you goes to uh, the folks who tune in um, either live or viewing it at their leisure or some other time, maybe participating in the, in the chat um, for supporting the show. Um, we love uh, having you here and we uh, can't thank you enough. So, okay. Let's have those recommendations. I'm going to go clockwise on my screen. I see Barbara first. Uh, if you get a chance to see anything that the Teatro de Soleil with Ari Mushkin does, do it. Fantastic. Devante. Uh, the Road, the book The Road. Oh, okay. God. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. Richard? Well, I'm going to mention a film, uh, and I don't know how many people have seen it, but. Um, Ghost with uh, Casey Affleck um, is a, uh, I think, a life-changing experience for some people. I know it was for me. Okay, okay. And Megan? I'm going to mention a book because you said we could do books. Um, yes. I just finished a book called The Light Pirate, um, and it's by Lily Brooks Dalton. Um, and I mentioned it because the whole time I was reading it, I thought this would make it a fantastic play. Um, but also because, uh, and not a movie, I don't think it would make a great movie, but also because it really, it had a very difficult time telling the difference between what is going on in our world climate wise and what was going on in the book climate wise. Um, it's really showing us like where we're headed, so. I'm just going to amend it. it. It's a ghost story. I'm sorry that the title is a ghost story. Casey Affleck. Awesome. awesome. Well, thank you everyone again. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, we look forward to seeing you next week. Um, um, please submit your questions in advance. If you want, if if you want to join or have a friend, go to uh, join uh, us. Go to strong.org, the thank you five page, and uh, thank you for watching. Have a great night. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Michael.